Okay. And just to uh, welcome everyone again. All right, so uh, this is our monthly extension Master Gardener Coordinator discussion. And today we have Pam Bennett from The Ohio State University that's gonna talk to us about getting ahead by letting go. This is a really timely topic, especially at the beginning of the year. So we're thankful that you're here to speak with us today, Pam. And I also see on the call, we have uh, lots of folks from uh, different states, and I also want to welcome some of the new people that are on the line. I know uh, Alyssa is a new uh, Master Gardener Coordinator here in Florida, and I see her on the call, so we're happy to have you. Um, the people that are on this call are a great resource to you and to each of us, and it's really uh, a good thing if you can meet some of, some of these folks and get to know us. Um, also, get familiar with the National Extension Master Gardener Committee and the work that they're doing. So having said that, a little bit about our agenda. We have our announcements, we'll go into the discussion and wrap up. And we are recording the webinar and that will be posted on the extension uh, create.org website when we're finished. So a few quick announcements. Um, I hope everyone is signed up for the e-news blast that comes from John. If you need any help getting set up with that, you can send me an email and I can walk you through the steps. Um, or if you need help getting set up for the Extension Master Gardener Coordinator Listserv, I can help you with that as well. I don't want to duplicate too much of what John sends out in the e-news blast, but there are a few things coming up. The International Master Gardener Conference is going to be in Pennsylvania in June, June 17th through 21st, and they are taking uh, poster submissions from Extension Master Gardener Coordinators. So if you have some idea for a poster presentation, I encourage you to go to the website or check the e-news blast and complete the information to submit your proposal. And that's a great opportunity um, coming up in June. But um, the uh, deadline for that will be coming up soon, so go ahead and, and do that if you're interested. There are also um, requests for information from the National Master Gardener Committee, the Subcommittee for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. They're looking for ideas on um, what you're doing or what needs you have to increase equity and diversity in your Master Gardener program. Uh, that information is included in the E! News Blast along with many other conferences that are taking place this year. So we're all very busy, um, but again, good wealth of information. And feel free to reach out to the National Committee if you have any questions. All right. So uh, let's take a moment, and if you could let us know what state you're from, go ahead and type your answer in the chat box. Okay, so we have a lot of folks from all over the country. I hope you can see that too, Pam. I do. Um, all right, so we have folks from New Hampshire, Louisiana, North Carolina, Florida, Maryland, Kansas, Colorado, Virginia, Maine, Iowa, Oregon, Washington and Arizona. Idaho, welcome everybody. North Dakota, wow, we have a, a pretty good representation today. This is fantastic. Excellent. All right, thank you all. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move into Pam's presentation, Getting Ahead by Letting Go. And I'm very excited to introduce Pam Bennett, although many of you already know Pam. Pam is from The Ohio State University. Uh, Pam is also an associate professor. She's the state master gardener volunteer program director, a horticulture educator, and she's obsessed with plants. Um, so <laughs> Pam, <laughs> welcome and thank you for talking to us about this timely topic at the beginning of the year. Well, I thank you very much, Nicole, and a couple things in the chat box real quick, if you All would, right. type how many I'm inches. having trouble hearing you. Can everyone hear Pam? Seriously? Okay, so everyone can hear Pam. Can you hear me, Nicole? Gail says it sounds tinny. How's that? Is that better, Gail? Okay. All right. Good. Thanks, John. Um, so while you are thinking about the chat box, type in how many inches of snow you have on the ground currently. Let's just see where everybody stands. Zero, 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 seven, thirteen. Ooh. Well, we got a really nice, none in Minnesota. Wow, check that out. 
we got a really nice eight inches on Saturday, which is the first that we have had here in Springfield, Ohio, Clark County, about the center of the state. And we're predicted to get another eight inches again this Saturday. So we haven't had any snow uh, all winter hardly up until now. So we're kind of uh, excited about this, having all this snow. As Nicole mentioned, and I do wanna thank Nicole for doing a, a yeoman's work and getting these seminars organized or webinars organized rather. Um, she's been doing this for a couple years now and as part of the national committee, this is a really valuable tool to connect with coordinators across the country and to um, get you connected to the Extension Master Gardener National Committee. And real quick, I'll put a plug in, if any of you answered the survey that went out for Christmas regarding the strategic plan, um, I want to thank you for that. We're going to use that information. We got a lot of great feedback. We're going to be in uh, California at UC Davis next week with Missy Gable working on a strategic plan for our national committee. So at some point in the near future, we will be sharing this with you either through the webinar, through the e-blast, or even at the coordinators conference or the state or the international conference next year, this year rather in June. So as Nicole said, we've all been uh, finishing our, our annual reports. I just turned mine in last night, thank goodness, uh, right by the deadline. Um, going through some files, purging, getting rid of things. We kind of do this the first of the year. I want to give you a little background about getting ahead by letting go. Okay, Nicole, did you give me the cursor or control? I did. Let me uh, try to see if I can get that. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and advance it for you. Okay, thank you. You're so, welcome. So, doing our annual report for Extension Master Gardeners across the state of Ohio, I've got a spreadsheet that lists all kinds of programs. So, I went in and I did this quick wordle for just two counties. These are words that are two county programs. And you start looking at this and you're thinking, wow, you know, it's overwhelming. So, you're looking at your programs, you're probably doing your year end report for your Master Gardeners and you're looking at the amount of programming and projects that you have going on. And, and you should be proud of yourself. For one thing, what we're doing in our, in our states and our counties, it's a great thing in terms of teaching people about horticulture and, and using good practices. But when you also look at this, you kind of get a little overwhelmed. A little background about myself. Nicole, if you would advance it. <laughs> all right, so it looks like we may have just a, some small technical difficulties, so just let me know and I'll advance the slides okay. for you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so in 1993, I came into Clark County, Ohio, and we did not have a Master Gardener program, so I had the fortune of starting the program from the start, from the ground up. Um, and we had training and we got everything going, but my mentor, I had a, a great mentor, if you would advance it. I had a great mentor named Jane Martin, I spent about 30 minutes with her and she said, you know, before you start a Master Gardener volunteer program, you gotta have projects, programs, you have, you've got to have something for them to do. Don't just train people and say, okay, there you go, off and do what you want. Have organized projects and programs available. Next. I also learned very quickly, as you all know, being in the program itself, um, socializing is very important because we, uh, we had our last class and I get up and walk out ready to leave and everybody says, well, when are we going to meet again? So I learned very quickly at the first class that socializing is extremely important. And as you know, with volunteers, that's one of the three reasons why people do volunteers for that social aspect. Next. As we started growing and expanding, we had to start thinking about, okay, the structure of the volunteers. Do we have committees? Do we have um, committees meeting on a regular basis? Do we have an executive committee? How do we structure our volunteers? So we started developing that structure and then our program started expanding. Next. So as our programs and projects started expanding, and of course, as people get to know you better and hear about you, oh, hey, I've got this garden you can come and work in, or my backyard needs some pruning, can you do that for me? And you know, I'll be glad to host a workshop. We, all, we have all heard that many, many times. But our projects started to increase. And looking at the number of projects, the number of people being the resource for these projects, I started getting to the point where I don't think that we can actually do all of these projects at a good level, at a high level, without really increasing our numbers. And that was just not gonna happen on a regular basis. So we, need to stay, we needed to start taking a look seriously at what we were doing. Um, next, Nicole. Around that time, and what I, I'm showing you with this, next, Nicole, what I'm showing you here is that this is not a new program. 
Um, I am one of the elders of the Master Gardener program nationally and here in Ohio. Um, I've been around since 1992. Um, Marilyn Spiegel, Gail Gunderson, Joe Jones and Nikki Conklin were excellent educators and specialists here in Extension in Ohio. And they created this program in 1992. Um, and I, I, you know, sometimes I like to go old school. Most of the time I like to try new things. But this is one of those programs and one of those activities that has worked over the years. I've been in Extension more than 25 years and I still continue to use it because it's one of those solid pieces. I'll talk a little bit more about the seven habits uh, later on and I'll also talk about the strategic planning as well. So next, so as with every good program, as you see at the top here, it's at our annual conference in 2006. So it, it kind of comes up and then it goes away and then somebody presents it again and then it goes away. But nonetheless, it's always in the background as a very good program to help us with program planning. Next. Getting ahead by letting go. Um, one of the resources that you will find, if you just do a research or a search on Google or Yahoo or wherever, getting ahead by letting go, you may not find it. It happens to be in this Cornell University Cooperative Extension Priority Setting resource. And I've got all the resources at the last slide here today. But on page 15, it specifically addresses getting ahead by letting go and the strategies. It also has some other really good strategies in it. So I do encourage you to take a look at this as a useful resource. Next. So in terms of getting ahead by letting go, you've all seen a strategy grid at some point in time during your life. You, maybe your parents have said, you know, decide, make a decision by using a strategy grid. But this is what is it's officially called a strategy grid. And on the left, you have fair service at the bottom and good service at the top. And this is just an example. On the right, you have good food at the top and okay food. So if we were gonna use this strategy grid to help us determine, for instance, where we're gonna go eat tonight, we would pick out a restaurant and this is Pam's Pub. And I'm gonna put Pam's Pub, Nicole, I just got it to work there. I'm gonna put Pam's Pub as really good food and really good service. The next one is Nicole Snacks. Somebody else added Nicole Snacks here and you notice where they put it on the grid. It's okay with food and it's okay with good service. So as you look at this grid, as you go up, the service improves. As you go over, the food improves and vice versa. The last one is Jim's Dive. And if you look at this, Jim's Dive has excellent food, but the service is fair. So if I'm trying to decide where I want to go to eat, I would look at this grid and I would say, well, you know, I really, tonight, I don't have any time for poor service. I've got to go, I want good food. I'm gonna opt for Pam's Pub. Or if I'm okay, I want good food, but I'm not in any hurry and fair service, I might opt for Jim's Dive. Now I know that's just kind of a, a silly way of showing the grid, but it kind of helps you understand how this grid is utilized. Getting ahead by letting go has four quadrants. So you would start developing your four quadrants. You would um, look at the first top left, low need, high impact. And I'm gonna show you how to work through this and how this works first and then talk about some of the resources that you would need. Um, so sacred cows, the very first quadrant in the top left corner. And you notice sacred cows have low need but high impact. So if you take a, a, a few seconds here and think about your projects and programs, all the things that you're involved in, and I, and I know we have some state coordinators and we have some county coordinators on the line, so just kind of figure out projects that you're involved in and type in a project that you're working with or your volunteers are working with or something that you're working with personally that is high impact but low need. It's an expected program or activity. It's hard to eliminate. And maybe it's time for a renovation or a redesign. So go ahead and type that project into the chat box so everybody can kind of see what we're thinking here in terms of sacred cows. Demonstration garden at the county commissioner building, educational programming for MGs. Annual statewide conference, plant sale, maple syrup day, demonstration gardens that volunteers just weed, plant clinics, farmers markets, demonstration garden with low visibility. Okay, 
So these are sacred cows. They are hard to eliminate. And one that always comes up when we're doing this is the uh, fairground flower bed maintenance. Um, it's, not, it's not high impact, it looks good, or it is high impact in terms of the visibility for it, um, but the need is rather low. But the county commissioners have asked that us to do that, and somebody put in their county commissioners um, volunteer garden. So, you know, when the county commissioners say, hey, we need you to do this, it's rather difficult if you're getting funding from them to say, well, you know, it, it's really not something we can do in our, in our programming. Uh, so that, you know, the need is there, but it's not that high. It's not that uh, necessary for the county or the community, but it does have high impact because the county commissioners are obviously going to be funding you, so you want to take, take that on and make sure you um, do that. The other thing I wanted to point out in the chat box where somebody said um, educational programs for MGs. Now, while that need might be low, the impact is high. Think about redesigning on how you might move that from the left upper quadrant to the high need. Is there a way that you can redesign educational programs for master gardeners to make them a high need? In Ohio, we make sure that our volunteers, we give them top-notch, high-quality educational programs so that for them, the need is high. They want to attend this. In addition, the impact is high because they're going to continue giving volunteer hours to OSU Extension if they're getting their needs met. So these are the sacred cows, the things that, you know, we, we may not necessarily want to keep, but we, we definitely have to think about them seriously. All right, the dogs, and, and perhaps this was an old moniker, dogs, maybe we would name them something else if we created this program today, but these are the, the dogs, the bad ones, the ones that are just low impact, low need. You're, you're looking at this saying the time spent and the impact is questionable. That is a potential for phase out. So think about a project or a program that you're involved in, and I'm gonna ask you with all four of these quadrants, so I want you to be thinking and participating. Think about something you're involved in that is a dog. Demo gardens that the public never visit, only MG seem to spend their time there. That's from a state coordinator perspective. Tree survey for local city, literally counting trees. Brochures for individual programs, excellent point. Fair superintendents, garden tours set up and no participation. So it's time to look at that. Well, we've always done it this way. We always have done this program and think about where that fits. The impact is low, the need is low, so maybe that's something that needs to be phased out. Good. Stars, stars are in the upper right-hand corner. These are the projects that are high impact, high need. They're the perfect projects. Everybody likes to get involved. They're needed in the community, they're wanted, they make that critical impact. And these are the ones, if they're in this corner, you want to maintain them or even improve them. Um, and this is something I've done getting ahead by letting go every three to four years, but this is something you can look at every year if you and your uh, organization have time for that. So think about stars. The strategy grid on the top right corner are the stars. What are your stars? Spring seminar, soil testing, you pick event fundraiser, master gardener schools, school gardens rather, help desk, public garden tour, pollinator festival, plant sale, and the list can go on. So these tend to be the ones that everybody gets excited about. Now, keep in mind that projects do run their course. Uh, we take care of the Utzinger Garden at the Molly Cairn Farm. The Farm Science Review is held three days in September. It's a three-day event. We used to do a program called Millin, Chillin, and Grillin. On Tuesday, we would have our volunteers there walking around with t-shirts on, answering questions. Wednesday, we would have music there, like a, a band or something real, you know, quiet garden type music. And then Thursday, we would be grilling. We did that for at least 10 years until we started to see that, you know, the need is not there. People aren't as interested in it. We're not making any impact with it. We decided it, it moved from a star to a dog and we eliminated that program. So keep in mind that programs can start up in this quadrant and possibly end up after several years down in the left quadrant. Next, 
And it looks like Nicole maybe, oh, got it. Strategy grid is Horizons, the final one on the bottom right hand corner. This is something that's up and coming. This is, uh, it has a potential. Right now it's low impact, but there is a high need in the community, like a community garden. You have that need. It has great potential because food insecurity is a top priority right now in many of our communities. You need to look at that project and say, okay, we're gonna make this better and move it from the bottom right quadrant to the upper quadrant, or we're not going to do it at all. So this is the four, these are the four quadrants of the strategy grids. And if you look at the Horizon or the um, Cornell uh, resource, it will show you the Ohio State University Extension uh, quadrant that can be used. You can copy this, or I'm gonna tell you how uh, to do this with your volunteers. So here are all your areas, sacred cow stars, dogs, and horizons. Now, the thing I just, I absolutely love about this option for making decisions and for looking at projects and programs is that it allows volunteers to get involved. And I think that's very important. I know across the country, all of our coordinators have a variety of ways that projects and so forth become an official volunteer program. Uh, whether you have a volunteer that's willing to lead the project and you officially say, yes, it's a program, or you have a request from a community member and you have enough volunteers who are interested and yes, it's a program, or it's one of those needs in the community that you develop a program for. Um, be, having them involved in this process of looking at these projects really allows them to have that ownership of these programs. Um, and I have found that every time I've done this, they, they really enjoy doing this. So how do you do it? A large room, and all of this is based on how many volunteers you know and all you have in your organization and also um, how many projects that you have. So let's say you have 30 volunteers and maybe you have 10, 15 projects. You want post-it notes and you want lots of them. And I'll share this with you here in a second. You want post-it notes and lots of them in all different colors because the post-it notes are going to represent the project itself. Then you want flip chart paper and you want the sticky back kind, but you also want to make sure that it doesn't fall off the wall. Uh, the logistics are really important because if the flip part chart paper falls down, then you're messing with it. Somebody might miss it. Um, they're going to be working on these papers. So that needs to be stuck to the wall. So if it's sticky, fine, but if it needs to be taped, go ahead and tape it. So here's what you're gonna do. And there are some options with doing this. And a lot of it, again, depends on how many volunteers and how many projects you had. So for this example, I have the grid in front of me and we only have four projects. So I have assigned the four different col projects colors. And if you don't have sticky paper, you can use, you can cut and print and make your own little squares. You'll need tape for that, but just some way so that they can stick the project in one of the quadrants. So everybody gets one of each color. You give them 10, 15, whatever, you, you know when you're doing a group activity, you know when people are just about finished or close to finished. Give them a time, I'm gonna give you 10 minutes, go around the room and explain what you're doing. So to really make this successful, you need to also go through the sacred cows, the stars, the dogs and the horizons. You need to tell them and, and set their expectations that they need to think about those projects and they need to think where they fit into this quadrant. So we're gonna go ahead and pretend that our group has done their job and they're gonna start fitting this in the quadrant. And you kind of need to explain to them, you know, you don't just put it down in the lower left-hand corner right here. You put it about where you feel on this spectrum on the top and the bottom or wherever you have your spectrum. So high impact, high need would be clear over here in this corner. So you have to explain to them how the grid, how this, uh, how this um, matrix works. So they will go, and the best thing about this, especially if you're a visual learner, the best thing about this, and you can see this right now as they've just completed this, you can start to get a feel for where these projects fit. You perhaps already knew this, but now you have their feedback, their input, their ideas and suggestions, and you can start asking questions and so forth. So the courthouse beautification is one of those sacred cows. 
it's a low need, but the high impact gets in front of the commissioners, the public's there, we put a sign in, we make sure that we are getting the recognition out of that that we need. We might do an educational program around there to make it, you know, more to meet our mission and our needs. Uh, but you can see it's, it's, there's more votes on sacred cows, but there's still quite a few votes in terms of a dog. Some people would prefer to get rid of it completely. Uh, in this example, field trials obviously is a star. So it's one of those projects that you're going to keep. Horizons, in this example, community gardens. So that's where you start putting a group together and say, okay, this is obviously very needed in our community. Um, right now we're not doing a good job or there's low impact. We wanna move this from this spectrum up into this quadrant so that we make that high impact um, and we help our community in terms of food insecurity. Uh, and then you see the dogs helpline ended up being the dog and and realize I weighed these and I made them so that it looked this way so I could explain perfectly how things work but it's not always going to work that way uh, realize you may get three dogs and five dogs or three dogs and three stars out of the helpline so then you have to do some further discussion on that and I'll show you how we can do that as well so uh, are there any questions this far thus far on terms of how to do this it's, it's so easy, it's so quick, but then as I said, I think the most important thing, the most successful piece of this, is that your volunteers can also see this. They look at this and they say, wow, yeah, you know, <laughs> the uh, field trials is very important. And perhaps they don't even know what the field trials are, but they've been involved enough, they, they know enough about it that they also feel it's very important. The other thing, if you have lots of projects, you can take a flip chart page for each project. So just have beautification project as one page, and then it doesn't matter what color you use, you still see visually where people thought or what people thought about that flip chart page. So that, that being able to see that in front of somebody, even though it's this person's pet project, they now can see what others are thinking and feeling about this project, so perhaps they're more willing to give that project up. Question, info on how to present to Extension Council as a need. Yvonne, let's hold that and we'll come on after and you can explain that um, at the end of the presentation, what you're specifically asking. Okay, so what I want you to do is take a blank piece of paper, draw just uh, the quadrants here. Don't, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be really perfect and list about four to five projects or things that are on your mind, activities that maybe you're involved in that you know, you've given some thought about, maybe we should continue this, maybe we shouldn't. Um, your personal life, if you want to, you can do this with personal priorities and so forth, but take a few minutes, write those down, and then write them, put them, list them as a sacred cow, a star, a dog, or a horizon. And if you don't like these names for dogs and stars and horizons, you can always update them. I think you know what they mean, you know what they uh, are, so there are probably better names, more updated names that could be used. So I'll give you a couple minutes, four to five projects that you're working on or programs. Think about their impact and their need. And then I'm gonna ask people to share some in the chat box. Okay, Yvonne, hold on to your question so that because if we start typing in, it's gonna move up to the top of the list and I might lose it. So hold on to your question. Go ahead and um, everybody list their sacred cows. List your sacred cows. And if you don't have any, that's fine too. List your sacred cows.
garden club presentations, field to feast garden, county pres preserve plant walks, fairground gardens, speakers bureau, Earth Day table. Those are your sacred cows. Um, again, think about the sacred cow has low need, high impact. How would you move that into the high need? For instance, um, take the garden club presentations. They might have high impact, but you don't have a lot of requests for them. The need's not out there. Your volunteers love doing them, but you're not making the impact that you, that, or there's not a need out there that, that you think matches the time involved. Possibly create a marketing brochure, possibly focus on, okay, we're gonna move this into that high need area by putting ourselves out there and making people really desire to have us as um, doing presentations. Plant sale, garden days with housing authority for garden clubs, talk to the countywide association, there you go. Okay, now list your dogs. Now list your dogs. These are the programs, low impact, low need, um, that you either need to eliminate or decide, do I need to change that to meet a sacred cow star horizon, which typically doesn't. Daylily show, fair help, library lectures, health fair tables, other events where we have to represent extension, Before you eliminate these projects, before you eliminate, let's say you were going to eliminate um, the fair help, what is the repercussions as a result? Um, you know, is it something that the county commissioners are expecting from you? Is it something that you can help them figure out a way to develop volunteers to help them at the fair, at the county fair? Before you exit a project, make sure you're able to explain to that partner if you have a partner in a project, how you're gonna do it. One of the first years we started out, we were just doing community beautification projects with the, the Community Beautification Committee. And our volunteers, while we were a very small group, our volunteers would divide up around the city and they would do um, all kinds of different flower beds, planting, maintaining, and so forth. As we started to grow, and as we started to bring on more projects, that's the first time we started looking at this and saying, wait a minute, you know, are we really making a high impact here? Are we really, is this project really needed? Uh, and we decided we were going to eliminate it and I went to the Community Beautification Committee and explained why. It was not meeting our mission of teaching. Um, so be sure if you have a partner, you can explain to them why you are eliminating. You can share with you know, the prog process you went through, that our volunteers talked about it, voted on it, and this is where we ended up. Uh, MG networking with four counties, grant for community gardens, dogs, meeting for disabled mental health participants. All right, let's do one final one. List your horizons, those that are up and coming, that have the potential to be fantastic, but they're gonna take a little bit of time to develop. Pollinator education for youth. And I would suspect that the pollinator education is on everybody's radar right now. After school youth programming, school and community gardens, Baywise landscape, conservation with soil and water, education outreach using suitcase modules, community garden support, interactive demo garden, hotline, and school gardens are just some of those that are on the horizon. So hopefully now that you have kind of a visual in front of you, Number one, you can take this and work with your master gardener volunteers or any, it, it applies to any group you're working with in terms of priority, um, deciding priorities and decision making. Um, and then like I said, there are a couple different ways to do it, but practice. Before you actually implement this, you need to make sure, okay, if I have a flip chart for each project, here's what I need. You wanna make sure you are all set and ready to go, which I'm preaching to the choir because you're extension professional, so I know you'll have this all set and ready to go. Couple other things, and one um, one that is in the um, Cornell Priorities book is the decision matrix. This works also, but I personally prefer to use this for myself as I'm going through decision making, have a difficult decision. 
Um, this is kind of like the pros and cons, but there are factors involved. So does the project meet, and in this particular example, this is from Cornell, Cornell Cooperative Extension, does it meet the mission, does it meet the vision? You can give it a score, not a bit, sometimes, and vary. And as you finish this, meeting community needs, to what extent, program capacity, do you have the volunteers, do you have the resources to do it? Program life cycle, funding capacity, public policy, and partnerships after you finish that. And then again, you have a visual. You can do this for each project. You go through, you mark it, then you'll see how many ones, how many twos, and how many threes. So that's just another option for um, using a matrix for decision making. One that I use also, um, especially if you got in that situation where everybody sort of, you know, there were two that were almost equal um, or three that were equal, whatever, however many, is using multi voting. Um, I ha has anybody used multi voting before in their meetings, brainstorming sessions, uh, working with your volunteers, just yes or no, multi voting? So I use this. Um, quite frequently with small groups, large groups, five or 10 people. It just really is a, a very good way of doing it. Um, you know, if you have, we, uh, our Extension Nursery Landscape and Turf team takes a team trip. We try to go every year. It doesn't always happen, but we try to. Uh, this last year we went to New York, which was a phenomenal trip, but we tried, we tried the mantra that, you know, you have new eyes when you get outside of your extension uh, corner and we go see other extension organizations. We try to get out there and see what else is happening around the country. Um, so each year we list all the different places we might like to go. Um, so this particular example, New York, Tennessee, Michigan, and Vancouver were the four that we narrowed it down to. Um, so in multi-voting, you tell everybody, okay, let's start with, we're gonna do, we're gonna vote twice, and everybody gets two votes, and you pick your top two. So it's very easy, somebody picks their top two, you keep narrowing it down until you get to finally the, the bottom line or the last one, the one that you're going to select. So in this case, everybody picked two, you can see Cornell, or the New York trip, and the Michigan trip, were the top winners, Vancouver's out. So this again is voting by committee. It's a very fair way of doing it, but everybody gets to decide, everybody has a decision. The second round, you knocked out the other two. Now everybody gets one vote. Um, if you have, you can really be free on how many times you vote, depending on the list of projects, the list of what you're doing. Uh, but it is important that you say, okay, we're gonna go three rounds or two rounds. And that all depends on how many um, items that you're voting on. But I find the multi, multi voting is extremely useful um, to, it doesn't quite get to consensus, but you get to see them, what everybody's doing and, um, or what everybody's leaning towards. And then everybody again here agrees to disagree. Okay, so to wrap up with resources and then if there are any questions. Cornell Cooperative Extension, if you just Google priority setting resources, you'll come up to, it's like an 18, 19 page book. It's got a lot of information about setting priorities. Um, it's geared towards extension and extension programming, but you will also find the matrix, the getting ahead by letting go, and some of the other things that I shared with you today. Um, also in that, if you Google getting ahead by letting go, like I said, you may not find that. In fact, it's really interesting. Here at Ohio, I can't find anybody or any place where it's actually stored somewhere um, on our websites. I know there's people who've been around for many years that might have uh, overheads, for instance, in their folders, uh, but nobody has updated this in terms of a PowerPoint and put it on our website. Uh, another really great resource, two really great resources. I mentioned mission a couple different times. If your organization doesn't have a mission or vision, and this, let's say we start at the county level, sometimes people have mission visions at the county level, sometimes they just adopt the state level, you must use that mission. It's gotten me out of trouble many times when people come and say, hey, I've got this garden, can you guys maintain it for me? Um, I say, well, our mission is to educate. And if we can figure out, you know, maybe we want to do it, it has potential, it's on the horizon as a good project. If we're not educating, it's not something that fits within our mission. And people respect that. People are more likely to say, okay, I understand and respect that than push you or force you or urge you to do this particular uh, project or program. 
Another book, and this is an old book, as you can see, 1989, when I came into extension in 1992, it was kind of being passed through the extension ranks as a very, very valuable book to read. Um, I've read it several times. I go back to read it again. But The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People has guided me throughout my extension career. Um, it has excellent, outstanding information in it in terms of personal habits. Um, but as you see, habit number three, put first things first. That's where this getting ahead by letting go fits into. And habit number seven, you're doing today, you're taking time out of your programming, out of your workday to sharpen the saw, to learn a new task, to learn a new skill. Uh, we sharpen the saw with our extension nursery and landscape team, turf team when we go out and, and do the trips and the tours. Uh, but we wanna make sure we sharpen the saw or take care of ourselves, give ourselves professional and personal development so that we then can be highly effective. Okay, questions. Going back to um, Yvonne's question. Issue is when at county level, funds are not available to maintain HORP programming. Um, Yvonne, let's see. Can we have you maybe explain a little bit more? Can we unmute her? Hi, this is Yvonne. Yeah, can if you, you could explain a little more. Yes, we have been under programming budget and we're looking at like decreasing HORT funding for the programs, which is sad to me, but I want to maintain that. And I'm wondering if this is an issue going on throughout other states or in counties as well. That's my question. How, what can we do to present the importance of horticulture to the county extension councils to know that? Thank you. Okay, this is a very complicated question because it does have to do with funding, but one thing um, that I will, again, take a minute to advertise, and that's NICHE, the National Initiative for Consumer Horticulture. Um, if you're not familiar with that, you will be. I think Nicole has a date scheduled that I'll be back on here to talk about the National Initiative. Um, this is basically helping to answer that question. Um, People don't value consumer horticulture, yet they use it every day, they live it every day, they need it in terms of the oxygen that we breathe. Um, so there's a group at the national level that's working on developing this program, reaching out to people, getting people involved. Hopefully, our go end goal is to get money, research dollars, to be able to prove that value of consumer horticulture, that you can't live without consumer horticulture. Uh, up until now, and some of my colleagues on here will understand what I mean, we've been the Rodney Dangerfield of uh, horticulture. Consumer horticulture just doesn't get that respect, even though it's a $2 billion industry that, that uh, employs over a million people. Um, so we are working at that national level to develop that respect. Um, it's an ongoing process. And, and I go back to when green became the thing, you know, everybody was starting to be green. We were green before green was popular, but what we aren't good at is marketing what we do. We are not good at telling people how great consumer horticulture is. And that's what we as an industry, as extension educators, that's what we all need to work on so that they see that this now is a star. Consumer horticulture is a need. You must have this. So going through getting ahead by letting go, looking at some of your programs, are they really valuable to the community? <laughs> Dave Close, you know who Rodney Dangerfield is. Um, you know, doing that process, going through that process, might be able to help you pinpoint what are those projects that are stars? What are those things that we really need to report to the commissioners as to their value, the impact that they're making? And that's also another thing that the National Committee with the leadership of Mike Maddox from Wisconsin, they're also working on impact. And as Nicole said, you just saw an email came out about reporting. So that reporting is gonna be very important so that nationally, we show what the Master Gardener Volunteer Program does in terms of making that impact. So that's a good question. It's a tough question. I, I don't know that there's a, a clear answer. And if anybody else wants to chime in. Yvonne, this is Nicole. Um, here in Florida, uh, in partnership with our Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, we've tried to quantify a lot of the services that we provide, whether it is individual consultations or site visits or articles um, that are published in local newspapers. And so if you're interested in finding ways to quantify some of the services that you offer, 
um, just reach out to me by email and I can send you some spreadsheets that you might find helpful um, when you're communicating the value of your program to stakeholders. So Yvonne asked any impact release you could share. Nicole, I don't know if you have it handy, but if you have last year's impact from the, the report uh, from the year before, it's an infographic that was in uh, the newsletter, I believe. Oh. Yes, I can post that on the website um, and also I'll post the recording and uh, your presentation. So I'll put all that together. So that's just basically an infographic. The, the sad thing about that, Yvonne, is that not every state has responded and that's one of the goals of our national committee is to get kind of get collect number one collect the same things we're not we're not all collecting the same information we, cl we collect volunteer numbers we collect their hours their education but we don't all collect the same thing so they're working on um, local foods food insecurity and that's one of the things that almost everybody is doing at some point so they can collect that data that data then will be shared when it's ready to go um, and Nicole will post it, like she said, from the last two years, the um, infographic. Any other questions? Dave Close asked me who Rodney Dangerfield was, and I know those of you who are a lot younger than me um, may not know Rodney Dangerfield, so you'll have to look him up. All right, Nicole, that's all I have. I'll turn it back over to you. All right, I just wanted to thank everyone for listening in today. If you have additional questions, feel free to follow up with Pam about the presentation. And if you have questions about the monthly discussions or you might consider being a presenter, send me an email and we can get you scheduled. I'm still finalizing a few dates and so I'll send the rest of the year schedule out very soon. And um, just to let you all know, we will post um, the recording on our Extension Master Gardener um, National Committee YouTube page. There's lots of great resources here as well from previous conferences. And uh, remember to please be a part of the community of practice, uh, and also to pass that along with maybe other coordinators that could benefit from these. Uh, thank you, everybody. Again, our uh, monthly discussions are the third Wednesday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern. So feel free to set a standing appointment on your calendar. And uh, if you can't make it, then you'll be able to go back and listen to an archived recording. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your week. And I will post the recording very soon and send you all an email to the listserv. Thank you so much, Pam. Learned a lot, appreciated the presentation. My pleasure, Nicole. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm so glad you got your report done too. Take oh a deep my breath. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we can all relate. <laughs> yeah, when does yours do? Uh, ours is due the first week of December, so typically oh. we end up spending, you know, around Thanksgiving time working on it, but oh, at least I, that's done, but it's yeah. still crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's funny watching Facebook, all my colleagues, well, I'm almost done. And